nature of the process that goes about going, that goes about having a go-ness to it. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately, one of the things that has been inspiring me most over the last year or two has been thinking about the nature of evolution and how fundamental of a process it is. Um, what I'm what I'm about to say is inspired by conversations with a number of people and podcasts and stuff. Among them, Jordan Hall, um, my friend Eric Chisholm, um, and um, also a podcast I recently listened to um, where Carl Friston is being um, interviewed by Reese Lindmark. And um, and there's there's this perceptual shift I've found that's incredibly powerful and invigorating, um, which is a coming into awareness of how much of what's happening is evolutionary in nature. And so I want to just try to describe that perspective a little bit, see if I can point it out to you. So the most obvious thing when we talk about evolution is biological evolution. There's some sense of um, you know, organisms that are better at surviving and better at reproducing um, make more of themselves. And so if there's some sort of adaptation that lets an animal run faster or whatever, then it, um, they're, you know, that type of animal comes to exist more. This is the type of evolution that we're most familiar with. I don't actually know if that's where the word was originally coined or, or not, but um, that's the kind of template for the, the concept of Let's evolution stop. is Let's biological evolution. Change. And, um, but what I've been realizing is that evolution goes back way further and it also goes forward way further. Um, and the different layers of evolution are built upon each other. So going, going way far back, um, there's, and this, this stuff is coming in part from Carl Friston's stuff, um, about the free energy principle and so on. There's a way in which evolutionary processes are occurring in order to create the dynamic equilibrium that is a planet orbiting a star. You know, this is not a, a static situation. I mean, in some sense, nothing is static, but in particular, the planet orbiting the star is, is moving a lot, but it's moving in a particular patterned way that reproduces itself. Um, it doesn't, um, it's not chaos, it's not randomness, it's a, a recreation of the very orbit that it's in. And maybe even before that, there's just even the state, there's the, there's the evolutionary stability of, um, you know, instead of just having a bunch of cosmic dust, you, you have planets that are actually um, composed, or you have sort of the matter in the universe coalescing into planets. And once it has coalesced, it stays there, you know, because gravity pulls it in. So, um, so evolution goes all the way back to that. Um, these these basic structures, these basic uh, things that once they exist tend to keep existing. Um, there's no agency involved, but there is um, attractor states, um, uh, which is, uh, I guess, a core concept here. So, um, and then on top of that, you've got single-celled life, and then on top of that, you've got multicellular life, and there's um, the the universe itself like it is we don't know where it's going but um like we can't predict it in the way that we can predict you know that if i if i pick something up and then i drop it i can predict that it will fall i can't i can't i couldn't actually have re easily predicted where it would bounce you get some chaos going on there but i can predict it will fall because of the law of gravity so we don't have a law like that for evolution but what we do know is that we get more of stuff that works better, better according to the definition of evolution, which is not inherently um, in service to anything, but is is just what what persists and what recreates. And um, and on a long time scale, we're going to have things that are better at becoming better at persisting and recreating, and that's how you get things like DNA coming to evolve, because DNA is the system by which. Um, evolution uh, in organisms becomes efficient, like becomes um, very fine-grained, you know. Um, and so, so, then, so then you've got biological evolution, and then at a certain point you evolve, um, uh, 
you evolve humans, or proto-humans even, um, who, uh, who start to have cultural evolution occur. And the first kind of cultural evolution, this is now a crib from David Deutsch a bit, the first kind of cultural evolution is entirely unconscious. You've got um, patterns of behavior that rather than being encoded in the DNA are encoded in the culture. But the people in that culture largely don't have any understanding of why they are exhibiting these patterns of behavior. They're simply reproducing them. But now you can have that, um, you can have, I guess, the iteration of those behaviors and the evolution of them happens on a time scale and with a level of precision that is um, uh, impossible to encode in DNA and that is happening um, faster than you can do with DNA. And so what, what, what happens here is that this kind of evolution, mimetic evolution, outclasses biological evolution, which means that uh, for the human species, a ton of evolutionary pressure is now off of getting us to behave in particular ways um, or getting us to have particular physical capabilities. The evolutionary pressure is now on how well can we um, uh, uh, share and develop these memes instead. And so now we're getting into mimetic evolution. And this is sort of the interplay of mimetic and biological evolution. Um, some great stuff on that in Joseph Henrik's book, The Secret of Our Success, which talks about how developing memes allowed humans to, um, uh, it, like, shifted humans out of the realm of, well, it's not that we aren't still biologically evolving, but it's like we're biologically evolving, for instance, to use, uh, to have really weak stomachs compared to most animals. That's why we have to cook a lot of our food, and we can eat a lot of different stuff, but we, we need to, you know, prepare it. Um, but we know how to, we have the technology to, we have you know, cooking and, and other processing technology. So, um, and so, and that lets us save energy in terms of how our, our bodies are running. So then there's a transition that David Deutsch talks about from biologic or from, um, from a medic evolution that's happening unconsciously, where as far as the individual humans are concerned, you're just trying to recreate the meme exactly as it is because I say so get a shift from that to mimetic evolution that's actually happening consciously and um, you know science is sort of theoretically the, the kind of classic example of this um, but um, but it, it happens it happens with, with culture and it happens with other other domains as well what you have is an investigation into the nature of knowledge and now there's a shift in the relationship between the memes and the people where the people aren't just propagating the memes because that's what the memes say to do and that's what they understand goodness to be is propagating the memes no matter what. The people are now actually engaged in more of a conscious selection process of which memes they themselves personally prefer. Um, so we're in, a, we're in a transition phase at the moment between what Deutsch calls anti-rational memes which propagate themselves regardless of how actually useful they are to their hosts. Um, although obviously if they just kill you immediately, they're not gonna be very useful. But the, the memes are sort of optimized for spreading themselves. A shift from those anti-rational memes to what he calls rational memes, I, I wouldn't use that word exactly, but they are certainly aligned with uh, human sense-making, aligned with human value. Um, uh, um, Next stop. Uh, I, I might be inclined to call them something like synergic memes. Um, upward spiral memes. Anyway, um, so uh, so yeah, and so we're, we're in an evolutionary process shifting between those two kinds of memes. At the same time, another evolutionary process that I see happening is an evolutionary process of um, people becoming more and more capable of bridging um, each other, like bridging perspectives between each other. This doesn't follow from the mimetic thing exactly i mean it kind of does i'm not sure though i'm not i'm not and i'm not sure how but um you have um memes that um sorry i spaced out so um another evolutionary process that's happening as far as i can tell and as far as various people i've talked to about this can tell is a coming into collective some sort of collective consciousness something and um 
and that, that sort of phrase gets thrown around as like a sort of buzzword or whatever. I think a lot of people have perceived this in different ways. You know, there's a there's a perspective from which you can sort of say, oh, the, the whole human race is some degree of awake or aware. Um, and Jack Dorsey recently tweeted something like, Twitter is the closest thing we have to a global consciousness. And I, I think there's, there's aspects of that. But um, the human race is currently way too fragmented to actually have a perspective on something as a whole, right? Um, you know, m much like a split brain, split brain patient has, you know, two totally different um, interpretations going on of roughly the same sensory input, um, and it has, you know, gets into conflict because it can't bridge those, um, humans largely also have trouble forming multi-person perspectives, even on the scale of just two people or five people, like, um, but it's possible, as far as I can tell. To, um, to have a, a first-person experience that is uh, also truly multi-person, um, like multi, um, yeah, multi-human. Um, and, um, I got some trees whacking against the, the bus here. Anyway, so, um, and so this seems to be a phase transition. Um, which we are, uh, but which because we are becoming aware of evolution itself, we can start to look ahead and anticipate in ways that would not have been possible for any of the previous stages of evolution. And so maybe that's part of the bridge between mimetic evolution becoming conscious 72, and um, us becoming conscious of evolution itself. Um, the concept of meme is very new. We didn't have the idea of, of an evolving idea 50 years ago, something like that, is, is about how old the idea of a meme is. And so, um, yeah, there's there's something very profound um, here in um, in this space of realizing that the entire universe is an evolutionary process and realizing, as people do in, in spiritual moments, realizing that you are the universe. And so realizing that you're not just the universe becoming aware of itself in a sort of momentary sense, you are the process of evolution becoming aware of itself and be beginning to be able to be self-directed without ceasing to be evolution. Um, there's still gradients that need to be followed for fitness to occur, um, for, for evolution to occur. Um, but you get to, um, you get to be participating, I guess, in the process of evolution in a conscious way. And I have experienced moments of that, uh, aspects of that in my life. And I found it to be one of the most ecstatic experiences that I've had. And it's something that I'm wanting to figure out how to invite more people into, um, to get more people in touch with how that how that happens and what that feels like, and to um, to give more people a taste of the experience of having a, a kind of collective um, collective perspective on this. Um, my friend Michael Smith says something about said something to me recently about. Um, from like the collective consciousness will always will always be subjective like it'll always be from your perspective you'll be at the center of it and you'll also know that from other people's perspectives that they're at the center of it so so you don't somehow lose your first personness you are experiencing collective intelligence collective agency collective awareness from your own vantage point with others um and and then this larger hole emerges, but it's not outside you. It, um, it's not other, it's you are of it and it is you. Um, yeah. Next stop, East Sandwich at Stelly's Crossroad. So. Yeah. Something really cool here. A lot of different factors go into making those kinds of experiences with groups possible, and I've been exploring what those are for about a decade, and that's kind of the main thing that I'm doing in my life, is figuring out what what are the enabling conditions for that. Um, individually, collectively, yeah, what are all the factors that go into making those experiences possible? And, uh, 
yeah, it's uh, it's kind of exhilarating. <laughs>